Hey guys, it's Gary. As a bunch of you know, uh, two days ago I attempted, well I didn't attempt, I actually recorded a, a record for me, 77 plus minute video uh, on Ralph Towner and something happened to the video file itself apparently got corrupted, which I didn't catch before I attempted to uh, upload it to YouTube and uh, YouTube couldn't handle the corrupt file and basically sat there processing it for about 30 hours um, before I finally gave up. Um, so, I'm going to redo this, and I did some things I shouldn't have bothered to do, like so I'm frustrated by some of the vinyl I can't find for Ralph Towner, today's subject, and um, I went looking for the vinyl again that I couldn't find the first time. Of course, I couldn't find it the second time either. Um, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, this certainly isn't going to be brief. But um, Miss Vinyl Spin, which is Jeff, uh, did a record, set, I believe it was 78 minutes and 50 second video on Moog. Uh, some interesting Moog pop oriented albums from the, um, mostly from the late, from the 60s, uh, and also going into the 70s. And it's a great video, and you guys should watch it if you haven't. Um, but at 78 minutes and 50 seconds, he exceeded my 75 minute limit uh, that I had prior to that, or my, my record, I should say. Um, and then I recorded the Ralph Tanner video when it was 77 and changed and I had to hurry up and cut it off because I don't want to beat Jeff's record. I'm handing the crown over to him for epics and I want him to keep it. So, Ralph Towner. Um, everyone thinks of Ralph Towner as a guitarist. I think of him as a guitarist. But actually he played piano before uh, guitar and he only took guitar up after he was already studying music at universities, apparently. And he skipped all over studying music. Um, but he, for many years, I believe even after he started his solo career and his band Oregon was going, um, in order to just pay the bills, he was basically a for-hire pianist and played club dates for people and things like that as a pianist. So initially he got known as a pianist, oddly enough, and it wasn't until he was in his college years that he gained an interest in guitar, uh, specifically classical guitar, most of you folks out there should know that he never touches electric. He's, there's no recorded evidence of him playing electric guitar. Um, he's strictly a, a nylon string and um, an acoustic, pretty much 12 string. I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever heard him play a six string acoustic. He plays a 12 string acoustic. And he plays keyboards, and he plays cornet on occasion, and he plays French horn on occasion. Uh, am I missing something? I know he's played percussion, a little bit of hand percussion too. Um, I, I can't I can't exceed Jeff's record, so I'm not going to rush through this stuff, but I'm not going to delay any further. Um, Ralph's solo career actually started with, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is his first DCM album, something called, and this is one of the vinyls that I couldn't find, recorded in November 72 for ECM Records, um, called Trios and Solos, credited to Ralph Towner with Glenn Moore. Now. Glenn Moore is also a member of Oregon, who were under contract. I think it was to Vanguard Records at the time, but they had another uh, contract at the time for Oregon. And I'm guessing Manfred Eicher was a fan of Oregon, uh, maybe a little bit more specifically Ralph Towner, but Oregon as well. And my thought is he probably wanted to sign Oregon at the time, but couldn't because of their contract. And by the way, their contract forbid the four members of Oregon from appearing anywhere together on uh, on any track on an album anywhere, uh, all four members. So how they got around it was this came out as a Ralph Towner with Glenn Moore album. Strange because Glenn, Glenn Moore actually has a couple, I think a fairly long bass solo on this album or a couple tracks just to himself, a solo bass. And Ralph has some solo tracks and all four original members of Oregon appear on this, but not all together. So you have permeations of um, also Paul McCandless, the, the oboe player of Oregon and horn player, and Colin Walcott, who plays sitar and tabla in Oregon. He only plays tabla here. Um, they, so they do these things where there's three of them together on tracks, but not the fourth member, just to avoid that whole legal thing. Um, so I, to this day, I wonder if this really would have been an Oregon album if they hadn't been on contract somewhere else, or if all four members would have actually appeared on a, a good chunk of the disc had it not been in the contract that they couldn't do so um, with their other record label at the time. It's a good album. Um, 
It's a nice album, but this is one of those examples of an ECM that was recorded in New York, not the typical uh, two recording studios in Ludwigsburg and Oslo um, that are typically used by ECM, so the sound isn't as good. Um, you're also got a couple examples of things that were not recorded in those studios, and for me, I can tell the audio quality right away. It's a good album. It's a kickoff to a start of his solo career. Oregon, the band was already going at that point. Um, not incredibly well established, actually. They may have only had a couple albums out at this point when this was recorded in November 72. So they were all also kind of in their infancy. Uh, it's a good album. It's a good album with all four members of Oregon on there. Uh, let me see. There's tracks with uh, Ralph Towner, bassist Glenn Moore, and Colin Walcott on tabla. Some solo guitar. Uh, another trio with Towner, Glenn Moore on bass, and Paul McCandless on oboe. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a Glenn Moore bass solo. Strange. That's six and a half minutes long. Um, <laughs> yeah, a whole bunch of 12-string solo things by, by Ralph Towner. Another track by Towner, uh, Glenn Moore, and Paul McCandless. So all four guys in Oregon ha are on here, and it's kind of like an Oregon album. I included it with Ralph Towner because it came out under his own name, and he's really the composer of the album. His next solo album for ECM, which is, I guess is really his second solo album, um, was recorded in April 1973, and this really is a solo album, because and this, this is one of the ones that I love, called Diary. And this is one of the ones that I have on vinyl that I cannot find. This is really the one... Well, the last one, too. I was, But I was really looking for this one because it's got a nice album cover, and I wanted to show the um, full-size vinyl cover. And uh, I can't find it. I know I have it. Um, so, again, this is recorded in uh, April 73 and has Ralph Towner all by himself. This is my favorite setting for him in a lot of ways. Um, playing totally solo. Overdubbing parts. Later on in his career, Ralph got to the point where he was recording basically solo guitar albums in the studio, but they were live. He wasn't doing overdubbing. I don't know why he's not taking advantage of the studio, but um, anyway. Uh, in this one, he plays a typical 12-string and classical guitars, plays piano beautifully, and he also plays gongs. There's a couple avant-garde tracks on here that the gongs, uh, you know, he's banging on gongs and stuff like that. Um, interesting album. Very interesting. It has uh, a couple songs that are fairly, probably, the, I'm guessing probably about the two best known songs that he wrote. One is called The Silence of a Candle. I'm not sure if he recorded that with the Paul Winter Consort. Uh, Ralph was a member of the Paul Winter Consort before he started his solo career. And uh, Paul Winter Consort, basically all four members of Oregon were in the Paul Winter Consort, which is how those guys um, decided to get together to form a band. I think a couple of the members may have known each other prior to that, but all four original members of Oregon did play with the saxophone player, um, Paul Winter's Consort. And one of Paul Winter's biggest albums, I want to say it was 1971, so it wasn't long before Ralph started his solo career, was an album called Icarus. Um, which I read that was one of those albums that even pe at the time in the early 70s, even people that weren't necessarily into jazz potentially had that album in their in their collection because it was very well thought of. Um, not a typical jazz. The you know the, the Paul Winter concert was very much like Oregon. It's very much like a like a chamber jazz group. Paul Winter's still out there uh, doing it, um, still playing after all these years. And I saw him live. I want to say five or six years ago. Um, in a wonderful setting, got to talk to him briefly afterwards. But that's where all these guys uh, apparently hooked up and at least formed Oregon, even if a couple of them did, didn't know each other uh, prior. Um, song Icarus is on here. That, that track that Ralph wrote during the time that he was in the Paul Winter Consort, and Paul Winter recorded a version of it um, with the guys in Oregon on it, um, and he even named the album after it, and it was one of Paul Winter's biggest selling albums. So it's a very well-known track, and Ralph does his own solo version of it here. Very well-known track. Somebody, um, believe it or not, there was a rock radio station, WNEW in New York, that, that had a, a talk show, and I can't remember what the particular subject matter, but one of the DJs did a talk show on Sunday mornings, you know, which is one of the rare times that they would stop playing music. And even though they were a rock station, they actually used the theme from Icarus um, as the theme song. Oddly enough, they didn't even go to try to find like an instrumental rock tune. They used the theme for Icarus. 
as their theme for the radio show. And this was probably, oh, man, I want to say late 70s, early 80s. I don't know what version of Icarus they used. It might have been the, the Paul Winter Consort version. Where's my vinyl? Okay. Now we're into the ones I could find. 1974, July. Um, Ralph does his next album as a duo with Gary Burton. Interesting that Ralph's got a history of um, getting together with musicians and recording two albums with them, separated by many years in between, and then never again. You'll see that theme probably come up. Ralph Town and Gary Burton, Matchbook. Um, they do a version of Goodbye Pork Pie Hat, which um, by, Char by Charles Mingus. Yeah, I don't know what I was going to say. By Charles Mingus. Uh, Ralph recorded that song at least twice that I know of. He did another version on his own many years later. Um, apart from that, there's a Comden and Green track, the, the, the songwriters that wrote kind of a lot of uh, jazz standards, um, called Some Other Time. Apart from that, most of the tunes are written by Ralph Towner. Uh, I believe, actually, looking at it now, uh, it looks like all of the tunes, the remaining tunes, are written by uh, Ralph Towner, with the exception of a one-minute track called Brotherhood, which is written by Gary Burton, which I think Gary Burton also recorded on um, Hotel Hello, the duet album with Steve Swallow, if I'm not mistaken, because I know Gary Burton's recorded that tune before. But this was July 1974, this was one of the ones that was recorded in the ECM Studios in Ludwigsburg, and I'm a little disappointed by the sound in it. Um, the problem with the, with a grouping of this, there's no rhythm section, there's no bass, there's no drums. There's only uh, Ralph on the 12-string acoustic and nylon string guitars, and Gary Burton on vibraharp or vibraphone. Um, so there's no like kind of deep bass instrument. So it, it's you got to be real careful how you record it, otherwise it tends to sound a little thin. And I know that's happened to some of Ralph's albums and even some of Gary Burton's albums that were not recorded by the typical ECM engineers for various reasons. I think Gary Burton was a teacher in Berkeley, and I think for many, many, many years, I think he's still there, actually, or, or is about to retire, but he's there for many years. And it seems like a lot of the albums that he recorded for ECM were recorded around the Boston or New York area, probably because Gary didn't have the time to leave the country to go record the album, so they did it at, at, clo at studios closer to the Berkeley in Boston, where he, was, um, where he was teaching, and he was, I believe, a dean at one point. This time they got to Ludwigsburg, though, uh, to record Matchbook, and there's very young guys. Um, the, the recording quality isn't, isn't great. ECM's known for its incredible recording quality. Now, if I played this for anybody else, and, uh, you know, you heard some records from 74, and you knew how recording techniques were in 74, you wouldn't think it sounds bad, because it doesn't sound bad. You get spoiled by the quality of the ECM recordings. And this one, it's not, you know, there's, there's obviously, there's no bass player, but, or real bottom end. But ECM is usually real good at capturing, say, the low end of the guitar, the low end of the vibraphone, and kind of making up for that. And here, it's, it's a little thin sounding, but it really isn't, at, that's the, the worst thing I could say about it. I still recommend it because it's a good album, it's a nice combination, um, good, it doesn't have a late night mood to it, but it's one of those things that you can listen to late at night because it never gets raucous. There's no drums, there's no bass, there's no screeching saxophones or anything, um, and it, it pretty much stays in the same zone when it, where, where it starts out. A uh, song on here called Drifting Petals, which, which Ralph recorded several times also, an original of his, which he records. And I like the fact that he redoes a lot of his uh, material, and he does them in different permeations of bands. So sometimes they'll record something as a guitar solo or a, a solo piece on an album, maybe where he does some overdubbing on it. Then he plays it with a trio or a quartet or something like that with completely different instrumentation. So it gives you a nice flavor. And then you see how the, the track... Uh, sounds different depending on the, um, you know, who, who's playing with him, the makeup of the band, and the instrumentation. This is a good one. You know, I, I, I'm going to listen to this as soon as I'm done here. Um, and one of two albums that he made with Gary Burton. Oh, by the way, Matchbook. I knew there was something I, I needed to... That type of Matchbook. The old-fashioned paper type of Matchbook. Um... Ralph actually takes a regular matchbook like that 
and um, threads it between the strings of his nylon string guitar. It, it dampens and deadens the sound, but it makes an interesting percussive buzzing sound, and that's why it's called a matchbook. I don't know if he does it now, but he did it for many years, and I saw him play uh, in a duet with John Abercrombie, I want to say around 81 or 82, and he was still doing it then. I tried it on, one, on my one of my guitars, and it works. Um, it creates a nice buzzing percussive sound, which is, is very good uh, to use in a setting, especially if there's no percussionist there. Obviously, it deadens the sound of the guitar, so strumming a chord isn't going to do anything. Um, it's basically, you have to play fast uh, finger style, but the lower strings get this nice percussive buzz. I don't know how Ralph Towner discovered that, um, but it alters the sound nicely, and he's used it sparingly over the years. Probably at this time in the, I want to say in the 70s, were the time he used it the most. I have not heard him do it, doing it um, with Oregon that I can recall, and um, but I did see him in the early 80s do it. So that's why it's called Matchbook, and that's the kind of matchbook that he uses. And I've tried it, and it works. Dare I say one day I would record something using that um, effect, but I think it might be perceived as a ripoff. I don't know. Okay. Now, oh yeah, dur during all this time, I mean, I'm just showing Ralph's solo career. I'm not getting into the Oregon stuff because it would be a three-hour video. Um, but during all this time, from pretty much the early 70s, when Ralph started as a solo artist recording for um, ECM, Oregon was going in conjunction. And it's amazing the amount of solo albums he was able to put out because he was doing some solo concerts, he was obviously doing solo recordings, but Oregon was also regularly recording and touring a great deal at that time, all through the 70s, really. And uh, it's incredible because, I, you know, I look at his body of work and I think that he's got a substantial amount of stuff for solo artists, even forgetting about the Oregon stuff, which is just an incredible amount of stuff as well. Okay, his next album, again, he puts together a band called Solstice, a uh, quartet. And this is an example, another example, of um, Ralph Towner recording two albums with the same lineup and never again. Um, you got Jan Garbrick on saxophones and flute, and Jan plays fantastic metal flute on here. You don't hear Jan play a lot of metal flute on his albums. He either dropped it completely or he went to wood flutes, which is a completely different, more ethnic sound, which I love the way he plays it. But um, the metal flute, he pretty much seems to have stopped playing in uh, pretty much in the 70s. I don't think I've ever heard him play. After 77, I don't recall ever hearing Jan play a regular metal flute again. Um, but there's a fantastic band. Got Jan Garbrick on uh, saxophones and flute. The great Eberhard Weber, one of my favorite composers in the whole world, on bass and cello. And John Christensen, my favorite drummer in the whole world, on drums and percussion. Man, oh man, do these dudes look young. Did I say when this was recorded, December 74? Uh, yeah, December 74. And there's one track on here called Sand that was written by Eberhard Weber, the only example of a, the, the two Solstice albums where there was some outside material used, or at least, put it this way, the material wasn't all written by Ralph Towner. Uh, actually, Eberhard Weber does get a track on here. It's a short track. It's a good track. He apparently wrote for this album because Eberhard Weber did not record it again, but they did include that track Sand on the Eberhard Weber Works compilation that I talked about a few videos back. And um, you see the guys playing. There's Ralph. There's Jan. I'm trying to get it so there's no glare. Uh, there's Eberhard. And John Christensen. Here's a particularly interesting thing about John Christensen. Look at how small his drum kit is. That's really a basic drum kit. I mean, you know, a, a, a one floor tom, one mounted tom. It looks like that's all that's there. A, and a bass drum and snare, a hi-hat, and a couple cymbals. That's a real basic kit. And the funny thing is, when you hear him play, it, you can't believe it. It doesn't sound like a basic kit. I mean, granted, I'm not sitting there analyzing it, but it doesn't sound like the kit's lacking in any way. Um, and he just he just really knows how to use those drums. Because I've seen guys with drum kits three times that size that sounded like they were playing like a five-piece drum kit. Um, and and obviously, that is a picture in the studio. I mean, that that... I'm, I don't think that's a promotional picture kind of thrown together and done. That looks like that was done in the recording studio. 
That's a small kit, and damn if he doesn't get a great sound out of it. And really, he uses the, the full capability of the kit. Um, this is really one of those albums. Yes, 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 my shrink wrap is torn. Um, this is one of those albums that's very easy to get into because the stuff on here is very pretty and the recording quality is very bright. Um, really emphasizing the steel string acoustic guitars. There's a, quite a bit more flute on here than typically you would hear with Jan Garbrick, so that's you know something that's high up, but very pretty sounding. Um, the sound mix is very bright. Even the drums are bright on here. They're very crisp, and um, you know there is like basically an 11-minute track on here. But most of the tracks, there's a number of other tracks, and there's a lot of short tracks too. So there's a lot of bite-sized morsels on here. And this is one of those albums that's very, very, very easy for people to get into. Uh, I think this is one of his best sellers too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it sold great. It sounds great. Um, my preference is toward a little more. There's, there's quite a few short tracks that, that I wish would go on longer. But this is one of his big ones. This is one of his, his things that a lot of people who um, may not have an extensive Ralph Towner collection or necessarily maybe are not into his uh, style so much or the, the extreme chamber jazz-ness, if that's a word, of his music uh, would ha probably have this album and like this album. I'm taking my chances playing music in the background, mind you, and I don't know how loud or quiet it is. Next up, this is one of my personal favorites. Again, here's another thing that Ralph Towner forms, and he records two albums with, spread years apart, and then never again. A duet with John Abercrombie, just like the Solstice Band, recorded two albums. Uh, just like with Gary Burton, recorded two albums. Uh, with one exception, um, Gary Burton put out an album called Six Pack in the 90s, and it was a collection of Gary doing tracks with various guitarists, and Ralph Towner does appear on two tracks, just as a duet with Gary Burton on that Six Pack album, and they're very much in the vein of you know the two albums he recorded, but it was only two tracks off that album. Very good, though. Um, so right now we're up to May 76, and an unlikely duo forms with Ralph Towner, and John Abercrombie. John Abercrombie. This is probably my second favorite Ralph Tanner album and my second favorite John Abercrombie album because it's really an equal thing. So it doesn't belong to one and not the other guy. But this is all lovely. There's not a, a duff track on here. Uh, there's a couple of ex little experimental things. The sound is great. Um, the way it's recorded is fine. And you think two guitars could get a little boring, but the fact that Ralph Towner does play piano on a couple tracks and just gives it enough additional color to, to make the variation in tones interesting enough to make you sit and listen to the whole 41-minute album. It's a short album. It's only 41 minutes. I highly recommend this to anybody that likes guitar music, though. And the weird thing is, there's not a single instance on here in 41 minutes and I think 9 seconds where they strum the guitars like you would expect the uh, Gypsy Kings or you know something you expect the two guitars get together some guy's going to strum a guitar and um, you know the other guy's going to solo whatever there's no guitar strumming on here so it's really fantastic um, how these guys play and what they what they do without getting into that um, you know Ralph Towner does a lot of finger picking things where he's picking out the individual notes of a chord um, very interesting so you got Ralph Towner on uh, 12 string and classical guitars as usual also piano piano adds a nice little touch on the, I think, two tracks that it's on. And John Abercrombie plays electric guitar, uh, processes it. So that's another thing, another place where the different colors come in here is John changes his guitar sound a little bit uh, on, on different tracks. So he gets a little bit more colors and variation from track to track from that. John also plays six string acoustic guitar. However, this is one album where you can always tell, no matter where you are, what track you're on, you can always tell which guitarist is doing what. Because Ralph doesn't play any electric guitars. And even though John plays a six-string acoustic on here, the only instance when John is playing six-string acoustic, Ralph is playing the nylon string classical. Very different sound. So you can always tell who's playing what. That's pretty. That pretty much doesn't happen in other guitar combinations because usually there's um, the same instrument, you know, two guitars, two electric guitars, two acoustic guitars, whatever. Sometimes it's very hard to tell who's playing what. Um, not on this one. 
because plus if you know their styles it helps maybe but if you know the difference between a sound and a nylon string guitar and a steel string guitar you can always tell who's playing what obviously all the electric sounds are coming from Abercrombie this is a great album just a, gr a great a great album oh I can't say enough about this one the very first track Fable 8 minutes and 40 seconds it just sets up the whole the whole thing now a lot of people uh, when they recorded their follow up album uh, five years later after this um, said that they prefer the five years later album. I don't. By far, I, I this is much more lyrical, I think. Um, this is one of those albums that I've probably listened to thousands of times, and for some reason I don't get tired of it. And I can't say that about some albums. Some, albums, my, some of my favorite albums in the world, I love. I couldn't rate them any higher, and yet I get a little burned out listening to them. This one doesn't happen. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I'll stay away for six months or a year maybe but then again I bought this in my original vinyl copy I bought in uh, I want to say probably 77 or 78 probably 78 and I bought the CD when it came out so I haven't stopped listening to this and I never will um, so now on to February 77 the second get together and last of Ralph's Solstice Quartet with Jan Garbrick, saxophones and flutes. Um, and incidentally, the last time that I'm aware of, 1977, where Jan Garbrick played the metal flute, um, this was uh, he wasn't doing it on his solo albums, I don't think at this point even. Um, and he, he turned to wood flutes a short time after. Once again, Ebhard Weber on, uh, on bass and John Christensen on drums. So it's the exact same permeation of the group. Man, does Ralph Towner look young there. He looks like a school kid. Um, recorded February 77. This one is much darker than the first album. The first album is pretty and easy to get into. This is like the flip of the coin. Um, this is like, okay, the first album was our pretty bright stuff. This is darker, but it's excellent. And you know, it's, it's a heavier listen. Um, you have to really pay attention and kind of be in the mood for it. But in a lot of ways, I actually prefer this album. It only has five tracks, so all of the tracks are much longer. The shortest track on here is five minutes and ten seconds, but all the tracks after that are eight, nine, and ten minutes. Um, and it's the darker side of the, the recording quality is great, is, is fine. It's just not as bright as the earlier Solstice album from 74. Uh, there's uh, probably, a, I guess, uh, maybe a bit more of nylon string on here. Uh, Ralph is playing, um, again, 12 string and classical guitars, piano, but he pulls out his French horn here, which he doesn't do a whole lot. Every once in a while on, the, on an early Oregon album, you'll hear him play French horn. So, And it's weird because there'll be several years between him you know, having done any French horn stuff, and you think maybe he's just dropped the instrument totally. And all of a sudden, a few years later, there'll be this little snippet of him playing French horn on, like, a single track on one of his albums. So I don't know if that's something you have to keep up practicing. And if he does, he's practicing and using it very little. I love his French horn playing. Very minimal. But uh, there's something about he knows where to place it and what to play on it. Because in the few instances that I have with him playing French horn, that includes with Oregon, for some reason, it's always the thing I hone in on. Uh, there's an organ track on the Winter Light album that there's a lot of overdubbing. So there's the quartet playing, there's multiple overdubs probably of Ralph Towner doing stuff. And one of the things he does on this one track on the Winter Light album, he's got this little phrase that he plays on French horn. And with all the stuff that's going on, the full band playing, even the multiple overdubs, I hone in on the French horn. It's just that effective. Um, so he knows what to do with it. I don't, you know, and it's been, now that I think about it, it's been quite a while since um, I can think of an album that he's played it on. But fantastic. Dark. Uh, you know, I would say get the, get the first album first, as much as I hate to say it, really. And then, if you want to hear the dark side of the first album, this is really fantastic, though. I love that album. Love that album. So that's what Ralph Towner was doing in uh, 77. Now we get to one of my personal favorites, even though I'm showing you a lot of personal favorites here. January 78, Ralph gets together a uh, unique trio that he only played uh, with for this one album. 
I'm going to show you this cover because it, there's almost nothing to it. it. It's a bunch of like squiggle, bl black squiggles, and that that stuff in between there that looks like um, looks like bad TV reception is actually they're actually pink. And Ralph said in an interview once that this was his poor selling album on ECM, and he thinks it was because of the cover. Um, it's a it's kind of a lousy cover. It's a lousy cover, but you know ECM is known for its landscapes in a lot of cases, not always. Um, and even when when they reissued it on CD, and I don't know if you're going to see this, they they actually change a very rare instance of them changing the cover. And at first it might look the same, but it's not. This kind of looks like a, a very abstract kind of scratchy painting, but to me as I look closely it looks like a bunch of trees so I think it may be a photograph or a paint uh, altered photograph or a painting basically scratches and shadows but it looks like trees to me and it's a rare instance of uh, ECM changing a record comp uh, record cover on, on upon reissuing it but back to Batik well uh, that was Batik as I showed anyway uh, January 78, the trio that only gets together once. Ralph Towner, Eddie Gomez on bass. Interesting uh, interesting member there. Eddie Gomez is a fairly excitable bass player. Played with Bill Evans, by the way. And Jack DeJeanette on drums. Only instance of Ralph playing with Jack DeJeanette. And this is a hot album. These guys are on. Um, it's just a trio. Bass, drums and Ralph on guitars and piano, no sundry instruments, no French horn or anything like that. Um, this is an intense album, and I, and I don't know if it was uh, Jack DeJeanette really pushing um, Ralph, because there's a lot of uh, tension and excitement, and there's quite a few long tracks. There's a, the title track, Batik, uh, is 16 minutes, and they play. Man, they're, they're just full steam ahead playing. Um, it's weird because you won't, you don't get to hear Jack DeJeanette play very often with somebody who's um, a leader on guitar, but especially non-electric guitars. I can't think of another instance, really, where he plays... Um, I mean, DeJeanette has used some uh, guitars at times, and sometimes they'll play an acoustic guitar, but not a full, full-on album full of it. So here you just got the classical and nylon string guitar, and that's the lead instrument. And, and Jack is just pushing, and, and Eddie is very, Eddie Gomez, very excitable bass player. Um, man, these, these guys are intense. You have to be able to listen to a 16-minute track. Another track is 9 minutes and 20 seconds, 8.18. So there's a lot of longer tracks on here. There's only five tracks on the album. Um, but fantastic, fant oh man, this is, a, this is killer for a player. And I, I am under the impression if you know who Bill, Blue, Bill Bruford, the drummer, is, I think he heard this album. Because um, quite a few years after this, Bill Bruford contacted Bill Bruford, the drummer, founding member of Yes, played in King Crimson, later on had his own kind of jazz. Um, Bill Bruford contacted years later both Ralph Towner and Eddie Gomez to do a trio album together. You think, is that a coincidence, or did he hear this? from 79, and I'm sure he heard this. This is so intense, There's, especially for players. And it's not necessarily from a technical point of view, but just the way that it's got to be Dijonette. He's just really pushing Ralph. Um, I don't know if these guys toured. That would have been a hell of a tour to see uh, and to have on tape. Um, but they do um, most of the tracks here, actually. Out of the five tracks, four tracks Ralph never re-recorded again. The first track on here, though, is a nine-minute version of Water Wheel, a Ralph original, that Ralph recorded and played many times with Oregon. He recorded it at least one time with Oregon, but they it's a track that they've played live for many years through all the different um, personnel changes in the percussion department, Oregon. Um, they played Water Wheel, and Water Wheel was originally played only uh, on the tabla drums because that's the pretty much the only percussion instrument that Oregon really used. So it's so weird or different if you've heard the Oregon version first played originally by Colin Walcott on tablas, where that was the only drum part in there because it's a really up-tempo tune. And then to hear it with a full-on drum kit, especially somebody as powerful as Dijonette playing and driving it a different way. 
uh, much much more intense. And I'm not saying it's a better version. It's just different because you've got a kit drum versus a tablet drum. So obviously it's going to come out different. Both versions are great. The, the, the two recorded studio versions that I've heard, and even live um, with, with Oregon Now, when they play with Mark Walker. But um, they also did Water Wheel with Trelock Urtu in the band. They even did it as a trio without a percussionist, which didn't work as much because you need some kind of percussion uh, driving that tune. But this, this, if you're just really into the, the, this is an intense album, man. This is, oh, that's a great album, too. I'm saying that too much. But I won't say that about all of them. Uh, we're up to 79, July 79 now. Old Friends, New Friends. A fairly larger ensemble Ralph decided to put together. And this is another one, like the first Solstice album. Very bright, very pretty, very easy to get into. Nothing avant-garde, nothing dark. Um, probably the closest thing to a jazz group because there's a lot of um, soloing going on and things like that and it's, an, it's a fairly unusually large band for Ralph. You got Ralph uh, playing 12 string classical guitars, piano and French horn which is strange that in this larger band that he would pull out the French horn. Got Kenny Wheeler on trumpet and flugelhorn. The only instance of him really that I know of recording with Kenny Wheeler except for the second Azimuth album, which I forgot to pull. Oh my God, I knew I was going to forget something. I forgot to pull the Azimuth album, which I showed in my Azimuth video, and it's sitting right back there, um, that Ralph played on their, their second album, called, their, their third album, called Depart. And that's a, that's a great album. It's the only uh, studio album that uh, the trio of Azimuth actually invited a fourth musician on, which was Ralph Towner to play guitars. Um, so he, so but that's the only other instance I'm aware of of Ralph playing with Kenny Wheeler. And the rest of the band, Eddie Gomez on bass. I guess he liked what Eddie played on the prior album, on the Batik album. Uh, David Darling on cello. Great choice, great choice. You've got bass covered, you've got mid-range, you've got Ralph on piano, you've got horns. There's a lot more going on here than um, on a lot of his albums. And the great Mike DePasqua on drums. Mike DePasqua, for quite a few years, late 70s to early 80s, uh, was like ECM's third house drummer. Started with John Christensen, who was um, somebody that, if, if you needed a drummer for an ECM session, and whoever was the leader of the session didn't have a set band or a drummer in that band, call John Christensen. He knows what to do. Later on, when John got busy or too busy to do all the sessions, uh, Jack DeJohnette essentially became the second house drummer. And Jack DeJohnette is all over the releases from the 70s um, as a drummer, not in his own bands, playing in other people's bands. And kind of Mike DePosquick got handed that hat down when those two guys got too busy and were off doing their own bands and everything else. Um, and John Christensen was also a part of... Um, Keith Jarrett's band, too, which which probably did a lot of extensive touring, which probably made him unavailable. Mike DePosco, also Pinette, and um, John Christensen. So, Mike DePosco. Oh, it's a big band. It's a pretty big band. Very bright music. Very uh, pretty. Easy to get into. Probably the closest thing Ralph did to a... Um, standard jazz group in a lot of ways because you've got horns, upright bass, a drummer, most jazz bands don't have cello players, but you know that kind of that kind of thing. Ralph usually does smaller ensembles. Um, there's a duet on here which is really pretty, Beneath an Evening Sky, uh, which is just a duet with just Ralph on pianos and guitars and David Darling on cellos. And uh, that's a track that he's recorded um, oh, a whole bunch of times, including in Oregon's done versions of it. I think Oregon still may even play that live on occasion. And uh, there's another track called Celesta, which I, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that Oregon played that too. But the other four tracks um, on here, not so much. Um, they have not really been re-recorded by Ralph over the years. But this is an easy one to get a hold of. Uh, in terms of getting into, I mean. Uh, no dark stuff, a lot of pretty stuff, uh, some up-tempo kind of soloing going on and things like that. Um, bright, a bright kind of cheery album. Probably if you're a mainstream jazz head, this might be easier to get into than some of his other things because it comes closer to that 
that mindset of a, like a, a jazz quintet. So also also in seventy nine, but in October seventy nine, this is a live recording actually. Uh, so called solo concert. This is Ralph's first. This is the only one I don't have on CD yet. Um, Ralph's first recording of just guitars. Uh, there's no piano on this. I'm a little surprised I didn't bother to bring a piano in uh, on the gig. Recorded live in concert. A lot of people put this as one of his best albums, but it's hard for me to say that because for me, um, he's done so many solo guitar albums, especially now and in recent years, that it's really hard to say which one's better than the other. This was this was the first. This happened to be a live recording in front of the, uh, an audience, but his subsequent solo guitar albums have been in the studio, but they've been live. They haven't utilized any overdubbing. So there's not a great deal of difference between this in front of a live audience and playing live in the studio in terms of the musical output. But um, he plays Timeless on here, a track written by his buddy John Abercrombie that Abercrombie recorded on his Timeless album. He does Nardis, the Miles Davis track, and the rest are originals. Um, no, he does Ralph's Piano Waltz also. Written by John Abercrombie, named after Ralph. Um, I heard a story uh, on a radio, on a, a, a podcast interview with John Abercrombie, and he's talking about um, at one point both Abercrombie and Towner lived in uh, in New York City, had apartments in New York City, and John Abercrombie would on occasion go and uh, do a little bit of house sitting because uh, at Ralph's apartment when Ralph was off touring because at the time Ralph apparently had some cats so John would go and I guess feed the cats and etc etc and um, he uh, Ralph had uh, an upright piano in his apartment so John would actually be in the apartment alone while Ralph was touring and Ralph would write uh, Ralph John Abercrombie would write some of the music using Ralph Towner's piano. So apparently John plays a little bit of piano. And I believe that this is one of the tracks potentially um, that John recorded and called it Ralph's Piano Waltz because I believe this is one of the tracks that he wrote at Ralph's apartment using Ralph's piano. Um, that was a funny little story. I, and I just heard that recently, like within the last year. Okay. We're on to the second and last. Speaking of John Abercrombie, Five years later, an album comes out. Why did they call it Five Years Later? Because it's five years later after Sargasso Sea. A lot of people prefer this over Sargasso Sea. I don't. Um, recorded March 1981. Sargasso Sea was from 76. Great. There's some great material on here, especially the long... There's two long tracks on here. Bamabia and Late Night Passenger, both of which are almost 10 minutes. And this album is uh, about 50 minutes, so it's, so it's uh, about 9 minutes longer than Sargasso C. However, uh, Ralph doesn't play any piano on here, and there's no keyboards of any type or anything else, so it's strictly a guitars album. There's a lot of different colors, obviously, with, with um, John Abercrombie you know, using different electric guitar settings. And John Abercrombie on here um, uses his little electric mandolin guitar, which to me is one of my favorite sounds that he ever used in, in the early to mid, uh, late 70s, whenever. It pretty much defined his sound because John used to always use the electric mandolin, a um, fairly high-pitched instrument. So he used to use that to like play or double a melody line from the guitar. Very, very pretty and very unique sound, and it's a sound that no one else has ever used that I've heard of. As a cute little guitar, it looked like a little miniature Fender Stratocaster. Because I saw him play, I saw John play it in his duet uh, with Ralph. The only time I saw Abercrombie play was uh, actually after this album came out in a New York club. There they are drinking tea, looking fairly young. 1981. They all had a lot of hair back then. And so did we all. <laughs> And uh, this is a good this is a good album. I prefer Sargasso C, but there's a vibe to Sargasso C that you just can't beat. I can't explain what's so great about that album. It not just the way it's engineered and the way it's played and the vibe from the music. This has a great vibe too, and a lot of people really claim that they prefer this album and bitched and moaned because this did not get uh, re-released on CD until like about the last year. Very recently, it had not been out on CD prior. 
And I tell you, I, I mean, I liked it enough that I took my worn vinyl copy and I copied it into my computer and I burned a CD of it. And in my head now, whenever I think of any of those songs, I can still hear the vinyl cracking because, uh, especially at the beginning of each side, there tends to be a little bit more noise on the vinyl. And both side one and side two start off very quietly, very, very soft. And I always heard a lot of vinyl noise. And whenever I hear these tracks now, I can hear the little crack and pop of the vinyl as it plays, even when I play the CD of it. Um, weird, weird. It's a good album. It's good. I just can't. I, I I just can't say it's better than Sargasso Sea. But I'm sorry these guys did not get together and do more. Um, apparently, it's Ralph that has no interest. I don't know why. That's a that's a good album too. Good, good, good album. On to December '82. This, um, in a lot of ways, I want to say, Grouse recorded a lot of great albums. I always say this is my favorite, and I think sometimes I just say it because I've said it in the past, but, but it is. Uh, Blue Sun is his return to all solo, but I think it's the last example of, um, almost the last example of him really using the studio to, to its fullest extent. No other musicians, just Ralph. And he does a lot of overdubbing. There's guitars, there's acoustic piano, there's the only time that I've heard him play coronet and hand percussion. He may have played a little hand percussion in Oregon on some of the early albums. I don't think so. And I don't recall. I think this is the only time I heard him play hand percussion. Very effective, too. He can take a tambourine and, and play a full beat on a tambourine. And it's very effective. And I learned a lot from listening to this album about how you could take a very small, um, light, softer sounding percussion instrument and actually not only utilize it to the fullest, but you use it as a driving force for the music. And it might just be a tambourine or a shaker or something. Um, I learned a lot about that. And it's one of the things that made me pick up some hand percussion myself and start playing. Um, French horn. Ralph's playing Fre French horn on here again. This album is particularly unique because of the amount of studio overdubbing that Ralph did and never did again to this extent. But also, it was the first time that Ralph, in, um, and that was a big change because Ralph, you know, I was, I always perceived him as an acoustic purist. Um, Dubbing, I love the way it sounds. I, I think I think Carm said this is his Gorilla 31. I think this is his one of his favorite Ralph Town albums, if not his favorite. Um, and it's interesting because there's one track here that blows it for me because there's there's an incredible uh, mood and vibe and atmosphere that this music creates. This is also a great late night album, even with a little bit of hand percussion. It's never bombastic or anything, except for there's this track called CT Kangaroo, which um, I believe is, I don't know what the kangaroo means, but CT I think is Charles Towner, which is Ralph's brother. He dedicated it to his brother. Um, but um, that track, it, it, I always program it first and play it first because it's an up-tempo track. It sounds like Joe Zawinul, oddly enough, on synthesizers. It's a poppy, up-tempo, like, almost commercial-sounding track. Um, the most commercial thing I've ever heard him do. Very repetitive, though, and that's the fault in it. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. And when I first heard it, it made me sit up and said, that's really weird for Ralph Towner to be doing that. Yeah, it sounds more like something you'd hear in a Weather Report album, and not even really a good track from a Weather Report album. Um, and I, that's that track still blows me away to this day, and it breaks up the mood. And I would deduct half a star for that track alone. Sorry, Ralph. Um, but I, I still, I never skip tracks when I listen to an album. So I program it first, and I get it over with, and it doesn't break up the vibe of the rest of the album because the vibe. There's some quiet moments, some real pretty moments. Um, Blue Sun, the title track, and I don't know why, um, when I first heard it, struck me as a very Brian Eno-ish track. There's something about the chord changes in the melody, and Ralph is not one to write simple chord changes and melodies. That sounds like a very pretty Brian Eno track. I remember thinking that. I don't know if I hear it as much now as I used to, um, but if you picture some, Brian, some of the calmer Brian Eno instrumentals, from, um, well, even from, from Apollo, from, 
I forget the name of the album now. Um, but he had, he, had, he had an album that had some vocal tracks and some instrumental tracks on there just before getting fully into the instrumental thing. Um, and um, God, I can't remember the name of it. it. It's one of his most highly thought of albums. But there's some pretty instrumentals on there, including a track called Zawa Null on there, on the Brian Eno album. One Green Earth, is that the I can't I can't think of the name of it now. Um, and I'm going to kick myself. And um, there's something about the track on here, Blue Sun, that reminds me of something that Brian Eno would write. Not the track itself, is the way the melody and the chord changes were. And it's strange, I don't hear a lot of influences uh, in Ralph's music of other people often that I can point my finger at um, apart from like maybe modern day classical composers and oddly enough there's a second track on here and Blue Sun the track that sounds like Eno is one of my favorite tracks on the album one of my other favorite tracks on the album is something called The Prince and the Sage and again oddly enough it sounds like a Steve Hackett track not Steve Hackett playing electric guitar but Steve Hackett playing nylon string guitar and if you're familiar with Steve Hackett's Bay of Kings album where that's pretty much a solo album with uh, Steve, like Ralph Towner, just playing nylon string and steel string acoustic guitars backed by his brother playing flute and, and keyboard synthesizers. And the keyboard synthesizers are pretty much kind of filling in like, like, a, like a, what a string section would be in a classical orchestra. That reminds me of The Prince and the Sage. The Prince and the Sage reminds me very much of Steve Hackett's Bay of Kings album, which is, by the way, my favorite Steve Hackett album. This is a fantastic album. This went out of print, at least in the U.S., and people are getting ridiculous sums for the copies of it. And I'm glad. It's one of the ones that I just could not buy fast enough on CD. And this is my favorite Ralph Tanner album. Definitely. And the second and last full album, anyway, that he made with Gary Burton called Slideshow. And this was recorded in, and this is, wow, like 11 years after their first album, after the uh, Matchbook album. Recorded May 1985. And uh, again, Ralph on uh, classical and 12-string guitars, Gary Burton on vibraphone or vibraharp, and marimba. The marimba adds a nice color that he didn't use on the first album. And the marimba's got a nice natural wood sound, but the bass end of the marimba actually is like a, probably a deeper tone, almost like a like a bass would be, almost. Um, deeper than the vibraphone tone, a little bit deeper than the guitar tone. So it's got a, a little bit more colors to it, but also because I, I complained about how that first uh, Matchbook album wasn't that well recorded. Well, this one was. This was done in, in the studio in Ludwigsburg. And the, the, the recording quality is fantastic. And again, they look very young here. Um, and it might it might only be for the fact that it's recorded so much better than the Matchbook album that I prefer this over the Matchbook album. And they do so, you know, it's not, again, no, no bass, no drums, just the two guys, guitars and vibraphone, marimba. Um, they do uh, Blue and Green, the track by Miles Davis and Bill Evans. And all the others are originals, including a couple tracks, Charlotte's Tangle and Innocenti, which um, I know... Oregon played both of those tracks at various times live. I don't know if they recorded them or not. Charlotte's Tangle, I'm pretty sure they recorded um, as a trio, if I'm not mistaken. And another version of Beneath an Evening Sky from the Old Friends, New Friends album. Um, and that Old Friends, New Friends album, that was the track that was done with David Darling on cello and Ralph, just the two of them. Now you've got another duet, duet performance of that track but with just guitars and in place of the cello, vibraphone and marimba. So it's inter always interesting to hear how Ralph interprets his own material uh, with different permeations of instruments. Ah, oh, man, oh man. Now my computer, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some playback problems with this file because my computer started uh, freezing while I was recording this. So if the audio and video goes out of sync, guys, hopefully it's not so bad that it's unwatchable. Um, I pick up in the CD era now because everything else has been from the late 80s is in the CD era for me and I didn't pick up a vinyl originals well you know in some of these cases I couldn't find the vinyl originals this one I, I'm pretty sure I have the vinyl of this City of Eyes interesting odd band um, I'm still mad that I didn't 
that I forgot to pull out the um, Azimuth album. Yeah, I forgot to pull up the Azimuth album that Ralph played on. I did show it in the Azimuth video. So if you really don't have enough Ralph Towner, go back to the Azimuth video and you'll get a little sneak peek of him in there. Um, in November 88, Ralph recorded another album. This time also, he put together a fairly large group, five pieces, which is not something he typically works with. Interesting, great choice of musicians, but very unusual because he used one of the Oregon mus musicians, which he didn't do after his first Solos and Trios album, which probably should have been an Oregon album, his first album for ECM. Uh, he used Paul McCandless on oboe and English horn on this album. And at that time, at this time, the Oregon and the solo projects were something usually pretty much separate from each other. Um, he's got Gary Peacock on bass. I don't know if this is the first time he played with Gary Peacock, but you know, with, within a few years they formed a duo, and again, they recorded two albums together, and not more. Um, Marcus Stockhausen, first time I heard Marcus Stockhausen, the son of uh, Carl Heinz Stockhausen, the famous avant-garde composer, playing trumpet, piccolo trumpet, and flugelhorn. First time I heard Marcus, uh, as, who I believe was fairly young at this time when this was recorded in uh, in, in '88, and uh, Jerry Grinelli on drums. This is the first time I heard Jerry Grinelli. Uh, Jerry Grinelli, interesting guy. I don't know how Ralph knows him. He's of the same uh, generation as Ralph. He's an, he's an older guy, and. Um, he plays drums and electronic drums. This is 88. Electronic drums, if they were even around, were really new back then. So he plays a little bit of, um, of electronic drums on here. He's an interesting drummer. And to be honest, I, when, um, I guess it was after Treelock Gertu left Oregon. They, they were a trio for a while. But um, I heard an interview with Ralph at that time where they were looking for a percussionist and they said they had some people in mind. And there's only two people that I thought of that would be obvious choices. Jerry Grinelli was one of them, because I'd heard him play on this album. And I thought, well, obviously it was Ralph's idea, and I'll show you some other Jerry Grinelli stuff. Um, it was obviously Ralph's idea to use him. So I thought that, and, and he's of the same generation, so I thought there was a good chance he might be asked to join Oregon uh, after Treelock Gertu left, and he wasn't. The other choice for Oregon that I thought was a natural was Nana Vasconcellos, the percussionist, because Nana was the only surviving member of the Cadona Trio, which was Colin Walcott's other band. When Colin Walcott, the original percussionist of Oregon, passed away, uh, he had a, a, a trio with Don Cherry and uh, Nana Vasconcellos. Um, Cherry passed away a number of years later, and Nana Vasconcellos is still to the, you know, the only surviving member of that trio. And I thought it would be an obvious choice, and maybe they did ask him, I don't know, to ask Nana Vasconcellos into Oregon as their percussionist because you would still have that thread of Colin Wilcott still kind of being in the band because Colin Wilcott's only other band that he did was Cadona. And that didn't happen. I, to this day, I wonder if he may have been asked to join. I hope that music's not too loud. I'm going to turn it down a little bit. This is a good album, another bright album um, I refer to them as. Um, maybe not quite as... Uh, traditional and jazz and easy to get into as the first solstice album of the Old Friends, New Friends, which is the closest that Ralph came to, like a jazz jazz band. But here again, you've got a drummer, you've got an upright bass player, you've got two horn players with Paul McCandless on oboe and English horn and Marcus Stockhausen on various trumpets. you got Ralph on classical 12-string guitars, piano, and he plays a bit of synthesizer on here. So there's a lot of colors on this album. There's a lot of variety in terms of the colors because of the number, not only because of the number of players, but the fact that they're multi-instrumentalists um, playing any number of instruments. So this is an interesting album. This is one that um, I am going to once again play when I'm done here. That was 88. I'm skipping ahead a bit. There's stuff that um, I'm, 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 I'm missing, I think. And one of them is I, I don't have... I either don't... I thought I had it. I don't have or I don't know where it is. Uh, one of the two albums that Ralph recorded with Gary Peacock. 
and I don't know which one came first and which one came later because I got a bit of a gap here. Because this next album Ralph recorded, which is one I, I like quite as well, Open Letter, was very rare for ECM. This was recorded in two sessions. This was recorded in July 1991, where some of the material was recorded, and again in February 1992. Um, so that's a number of months later. It's not the way ECM typically records. ECM, um, at least for their jazz albums, not their classical albums, had this um, system of working where they record all the, pretty much all their albums recorded in two days, and on the third day they were mixed. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time for retakes or anything like that. And they, they work to, to this day, at least on their jazz albums, pretty much in the same vein, I think. Um, this is a good album, too. I very much like this. One of these sessions has Peter Erskine on um, acoustic and electronic drums. I don't. It doesn't tell you which session he played at, but he's not on a lot of the album. So one of these two sessions uh, didn't yield a whole lot of material, apparently. And, um, but Peter Erskine does get a, a co-writing uh, credit on one track on here short track but but for the most part uh, and I like his contributions on this album for the most part it's the solo album though we're off doing the classical and 12 string guitars and some synthesizer but oddly enough um, minimal synthesizer you would think that on a solo album like this since he had just pulled them out a few years prior um, that he would use the synthesizer a bit more especially in the solo context and no piano oddly enough no piano no French horns or coronet or any of those funky other instruments um, but this is a good album too. This one I really like. I think I'm going, I may be going particularly fast because I know how long my, my, the, um, 77 minute video was. And, uh, I actually have more things that I pulled out for the second round that I forgot that I had. May 1993 is one of Ralph's two albums that he recorded with bassist Gary Peacock. Um, this is a co-led session. For, forget about the strip there. I, I always do that. Uh, Gary Peacock, Ralph Towner. This is called Oracle. Recorded in 93. And uh, Gary Peacock on upright bass. And Ralph only playing classical and 12-string guitars. And I always wondered why on his albums that he, um, with Gary Peacock, why he didn't play any piano. He, had, he was using synthesizers in his arsenal at this time. He didn't use synthesizers. Um, it's pretty much I think about I guess a live uh, you know a live studio date because Ralph does not I can only think of one instance where Ralph uh, two instances actually where Ralph actually overdubbed guitars he might overdub percussion French horn coronet guitar and piano but for some reason I can only think of two times in his career that he's actually overdubbed more than one guitar part on it on an individual track um so this is weird, you know, because like I said, Ralph had synthesizers in his arsenal, he played piano, French horn, and all that. He didn't, he didn't pull out any of these for the duet. It strictly is a bass and guitar duet. And, you know, that therein lies the problem, because there's nothing wrong with the material, there's nothing wrong, wrong with the recording. It's just that it really gets samey sounding after a while. You know, you're talking about, you know, like 50 some odd minutes of music. Um, pretty low key stuff. And the second album is very much like this too. But, um, I don't know w what I did with it or where I put it, and I'm not sure because I can only find this one that was recorded in, in May of 93. I'm not sure if this was the first one or the second one. I almost tempted to say it's the second one because there's a bit of a gap in his recordings here, but that doesn't mean much, really. Uh, he could have just been busy with Oregon. Um, so, now we go on to May 95, and Ralph comes out with this very interesting album called Lost and Found. And th now here's unusual, <laughs> with an unusual cover image, because ECM is known for its landscape photos and very atmospheric photos. Um, and this one just about fits the bill if you look at everything except the pig. I don't know how the pig figures into this. It's cute, but I mean, usually your typical ECM record cover would be everything you see there minus the pig. So I don't know if there's some kind of statement being made there or not. This, again, is an interesting album. Reminds me a little bit of Open Letter, in that uh, Open Letter had a lot of um, solo material and had you know a few appearances by Pete Erskine 
And this was recorded May 95, if I didn't say that. Um, this looks like a bass. If you read the back, he's got Mark Johnson on upright bass, John Christensen on drums. I was so excited to see John play again with Ralph because he hadn't played with him since 1977, the second Solstice album. Denny Goodhue on saxophone. It's a really nice, kind of not very well-known um, uh, saxophone. He plays three different saxophones on here and bass clarinet. And Ralph, and this is an odd thing again, just on classical and 12-string guitars. Where's the keyboards? No keyboards. You'd think he would take advantage, you know, use keyboards. And in, the, in, his, other, in his other large bands, in, in, in um, quartets and solstice and old friends, new friends, and all those albums, he was playing piano and even French horn at times and stuff like that. And I'm surprised he doesn't play any of those here. No French horn, no coronet, uh, no piano, no synthesizers. But oddly enough, even though this looks like a quartet, it's really not a quartet recording. Um, and I, and I should have I played this, too. But what I'm hearing is um, permeations. I, John Christensen, from what I remember, and I was kind of disappointed because I thought this was a band, like a quartet band, only plays on a couple tracks. So there's only drums on a couple tracks on here. And there's a lot of tracks on here. There's a lot of shorter tracks on here. Um, there's 15 tracks. That's a lot of tracks for... A jazz album, and certainly for a Ralph Towner album, and I was a little disappointed that jo that uh, John Christensen only plays drums on a couple tracks. So I think it's basically it's a listing of the musicians who play on here, but it's not really a quartet band. And I think there's tracks where Mark Johnson plays, and maybe it's just Mark Johnson and Ralph, and tracks where there's saxophone, and I think it might be also just a duet with Ralph. So it's, it looks like a quartet if you look at the lineup in the back, but it's not. But there's. Uh, there's even a, a oddly enough, and he, he, you know, he uh, didn't do this since his first solo album, since the duos and trios thing, but he actually lets uh, Mark Johnson do a um, solo bass track. He yes, he does do some. I, I put notes on here, and I should have just read them. There's there's duets with bass, there's duets with saxophone, um, and oddly enough, there's just a bass and saxophone duet that Ralph doesn't play on at all on his own album. Oddly enough. Well, as well as the solo bass track that Ralph obviously doesn't play on. Um, there's three quartet tracks. Only three. And they are not very long. And that is, those three tracks are the only ones that John Christensen plays drums on. And, um, yeah, there's also a trio with Ralph and bass and sax. Um, so not enough John Christensen for my taste, but it's a good album. It's a good album. And like I said, there's there's um, there's some solo tracks by Ralph on here as well. That was an interesting album. I like it. Now we get to the era that I don't say perturbs me a little bit, but um, Ralph suddenly was not, I don't know if, I don't know if it was suddenly or what drove his decision to do this got into this vibe in the late '90s. Uh, and in March 96, and I'm missing some of his albums here, but in March 96, he recorded his, his first of many recent um, solo guitar albums, not counting the solo concert from 79. Uh, that was a live recording of a concert where Ralph just happened to just only play guitars. But again, that is just a solo guitar album. Comes out with this album called Anna, A-N-A, -N -A, Ralph Towner, Solo Guitar, Studio Recording. Um, and again, it's just as the title says, it's just Ralph alone in the studio with no additional musicians playing classical and 12 string guitars. And this is the beginning of something that pretty much continues almost to this day. Ralph got into this thing of, I don't know why, wanting to record solo albums with no overdubbing, just basically live in the studio recordings of just guitars. And I, when I saw Oregon, I saw Oregon, I want to say in the late 90s. I uh, got to speak to Ralph briefly. Um, I kind of blocked his way of going to the bathroom until he answered my questions, to be honest with you. Um, and I told him how much I love the Blue Sun album, which was from, what was it, from 82, December 82, I think. And I said, I'd love to hear him play again in that, con record again in that context. Go in context. Go do a solo album. But go and use the synthesizers. Use the keyboards, the piano. Use the French horns, the percussion, all that stuff. And he said to me, you know, right now I'm kind of in this solo guitar thing where I just really want to record solo guitar albums. And that was 
20, 20 years ago now. Um, I want to say it's almost 20 years ago, and he's still in that mode. Um, again, a fine album, very well recorded, lots of new pieces on here. Um, but this is where I wouldn't say he begins to lose me because I still buy his albums, but because he's been in this recording, that, that recording mode of just doing solo guitar live, essentially, in the studio recording the solo guitar, I'm beginning to have trouble telling one album from the other. And pretty much since then, Ralph's continued on in that vein. Not exclusively. He's done, uh, you know, recently he did a, a trio album with two other guitarists, uh, for instance. But in February 2000, he goes back into the studio for his, his uh, next or subsequent solo album. Well, I don't know, real. I'm, I don't think I'm skipping any of his material here, but I could have. Um, and he records an album called Anthem. Again, another nice album. But again, what is it? Classical and 12-string guitars, live in the studio, no other musicians, but no other instruments, no keyboards, no synthesizers, no horns. Uh, nothing. He does the second time he recorded uh, Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. The first time is with the um, Gary Burton duet, uh, the Matchbook album. So he does that, um, and he you know he records uh, every once in a while. He picks out uh, Cherry picks a few uh, standards to record here and there. But again, this came out in 2001. Very good album. But I'm starting to, to have trouble telling one album from the other because they're all solo guitar, essentially live in the studio albums. Um, no other musicians, no real variation. And his next album, which I'm, I'm busy, busy flipping pages, looking for a recording date and not finding it. September 2005, uh, there's another album. And like I said, I think I, I actually I might be missing a couple solo albums here. Another solo album co co comes out called Timeline. What's on here? Nice cover, by the way. It's a good album, but it's another it's just solo guitars, just guitars again, live in the studio kind of thing. Um, and, you know, a whole bunch of new material that Ralph wrote. And I like it, but I can't tell these three albums apart, really. You know, when you, when you get down to it, I'm having trouble telling them apart. And that may be why I believe I've skipped an album or two of his, um, which at some point in the future I'd probably make up and get. Um, and I wouldn't say a slight, a slight ray of hope for me is, is uh, the fact that in uh, October 2008, which you're talking 20, 20 years now or something like that, since, since he started recording these solo guitar albums, but October 2008, he finally gets another duet album in with uh, Paolo Fres Fresu, uh, the trumpet player, who plays with uh, Carla Bly. Carla Bly, Carla Bly. I heard somebody pronounce it Bly once, Paul Bly, Carla Bly, and I've pronounced it that way ever since, but I always said Bly before that. Um, so Trumpet and Flugelhorn by Paolo on here, and but Ralph again just sticking to guitars, classical and 12-string guitars. But because of just the, the amount of pure solo guitar albums, it sounds like, oh, at last, there's something else to listen to besides just the guitar. Um, and I want to say, you know, it was at, at that time, in what, what, 95, when he started this whole rash of solo guitar albums, that, that all of a sudden, there's no more keyboards on a Ralph Tanner album anymore. Um, and the only place to hear Ralph play keyboards is in Oregon. And there's a lot of other stuff going on in Oregon, you know, with the three other members, musically speaking. So, you know, I always, I always, I very much miss um, Ralph, Ralph's keyboards on his own solo albums. And you would never know what a great keyboard artist he really is. Now, I mentioned this and I showed this in my um, ECM Works. Ralph Towner, they, they compiled a Works album for him. But like I said in, in the Works thing, I don't understand. They only, for all the material that he recorded for them, even at the time this was picked out, uh, which was in the, in the mid to late 80s, he only, he only chose select, six selections from three albums of his. He had recorded a hell of a lot more than that. Um, and two tracks from the first Solstice album, two tracks from Old Friends, New Friends, and two tracks from Blue Sun. I'm not complaining about any of the choices because all of the tracks are really good, but it's weird that they only selected tracks from three albums when he recorded so much more for them. And as I alluded to earlier, 
um, and I don't, and I'm not a person sure this came out in '97. Um, I can look for a recording date, but I don't know if I'm going to find it. Yeah, but I know it was recorded in, in the first part of uh, no, 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 no. February '97. Bill Bruford, the drummer that I alluded to earlier of uh, Yes and King Crimson and Jazzhead, who probably heard that Batik album, contacted Jack and Eddie Gomez, the bassist, to do a trio album with them. I heard about this. This is one of the rare instances uh, that I heard about an album before it came out, prior to the internet. And um, um, I was excited by it and very disappointed when I heard the album. Uh, they do one Ralph Town and track, but all the music is pretty much written by Bill Bruford. And the weird thing is, that if you know Bill Bruford's styling, he, style of playing, he's kind of a very excitable drummer. Um, does interesting things. And he is very laid back, and it's, it's almost like he's lost in this recording. It's like, I'm sure he heard the Batik album with Eddie Gomez and Jack DeJanet. That's what made him call these two guys up. He's basically taking Jack DeJanet's place, but he's not playing like Jack DeJanet. He's not really even playing like Bill Bruford. Um, he does this very laid-back, simple beat on some of these songs. I'm like, that doesn't sound anything like Bill Bruford. And there's not the long improvisation that you would expect. Like, you know, like Bill Bruford's a jazz head. He always has been. Um, I was expecting tracks with the improv, and they would just go off and fly in various places. And there's just a lot of short tracks on here. And it's kind of disappointing. It's a good Bill Bruford album, to be honest with you. It's the first Bill Bruford album I would pick up to play out of all of his albums. Um, but as a Ralph Towner album, it's like, wow, you would... The, the way that Bill plays on this, you would definitely know that Ralph did not pick to play with Bill. As a matter of fact, uh, Ralph Towner knew next to nothing about uh, Bill Bruford. And I recall reading in a, a magazine interview with him that he that when he was talking about doing this album, he said, "Yeah, he's some he's some big rock and roll guy. He wanted he wanted me to he wanted to play in an album, you know, with me and Eddie." Um, so so I don't think Ralph really knew who Bill Bruford was. Good, it's a good album, but it's not a good Ralph Towner album. Um, just just because there's a lot of short tracks and a lot of like, hey, that doesn't even sound like Bill's playing. I don't know what happened when they got into the studio. I really don't. And that's the truth. Now, I'm showing um, side projects now by Bill in case you didn't guess. And damn it, uh, there's no way I'm going to do this. <sighs> I'm going to exceed, I'm going to exceed the limit. Um, Treelock Gertrude's, I believe this is his first solo album, Usfret. And I think this was, this is recorded in 87, 88, may have been right around the time that Trelock Gertu joined, or maybe just slightly prior to the period where he uh, took Colin Walcott's spot as percussionist in Oregon, but Ralph plays on this album. And he plays, uh, even plays some keyboards on a track on Trelock's first solo album. And I mentioned him earlier, Jerry Grinelli, that interesting percussionist that Ralph used only on one album that I thought could potentially be the drummer for Oregon, um, called on Ralph on a couple albums, at least a couple albums that I know of, this one called One Day at a Time. Look at the lineup. It's got Ralph Tanner, Charlie Hayden on bass, Julian Priester, it's even got Robin Ford on electric guitar, and Denny Goodhue, Goodhue who was a saxophone player on uh, one of those, those later Ralph Tanner albums. Um, However, on this one, Ralph Towner actually only plays keyboards. Very strange. But, uh, when is this from? Did I say the year? Do I know the year? No. Came out in 1990. Uh, recorded in 1988, actually. Yeah, okay, so it was re really the same time as the Tree Lock Gertu album. Another Jerry Grinelli album. Interesting. Jerry Grinelli also did the drummer, once again, actually did a duet, a very, very, very interesting duet album with the Oregon bassist Glenn Moore. Just the just, um, you know, drums and the bass. A very interesting album. But here, on this album, uh, also from 1988, he's got, he's got Ralph Towner on here, Charlie Hayden again. I think, you know what? This... 
uh, this might have been one big long session that actually yielded two albums, now that I'm looking at it. Jerry Grinelli on drums, Julian Priester again, Robin Ford on guitar, Denny Goodhue again, and this time the only difference is um, the vocalist Jay Clayton plays on here. And, but yeah, it pro yeah, probably one big long session because Ralph is only credited with playing keyboards on this. Interesting. But I thought Jerry Grinelli was a, just a... I didn't know Jerry Grinelli until I saw him playing that one Towner album, but now I've got uh, maybe four or five discs by him. That one with Glenn Moore, I think it's called Forces of Flight, I want to say. It's a very interesting album. And, you know, he's an older guy. He's of Ralph Towner's generation. I thought he might be one of the guys earmarked to uh, be a replacement percussionist in Oregon. And this is a... Oh, man, is this a fantastic album. Oh, this actually by itself, even though it's an Harold Anderson album, almost makes up for all those solo guitar-only albums. Uh, there's four people on here, despite what's listed here. There's uh, Andre Clevy, I want to say is his name, a drummer, who also is credited on this album with only playing snare drum, just snare drum, and not on all, all of the tracks. Um, none of us can sell us on percussion, Harold Anderson, the great upright bass player, and Ralph Towner. Wow, is this an atmospheric album. But this is very, again, very unusual for an ECM album. because It is on ECM because it was recorded in um, different sessions. Now, again, Tanner only plays guitar on here. So you have just guitars, uh, upright bass, and Nana Vasconcellos on numerous percussion. And uh, Auden, Auden Cleavy on snare drum. Um, but this was recorded in several different sessions because two of the tracks were actually recorded for a, a Norwegian film in, in, in 1988. And it sounds like those tracks are just upright bass, really incredibly processed through these reverb units that makes it sound like a full orchestra. Oh, this is a killer album. It's dark at times, it's moody, it sounds like there's a whole friggin' orchestra playing, and it's just bass. All those orchestral sounds that they somehow get out just from bowing the bass and, and playing around with these reverb units. It's incredible. Nana Vasconcellos is the other guy in the album that makes the most appearances in terms of percussion. And uh, there's three different sessions recorded here. So two of the tracks are with Nana Vasconcellos on percussion that recorded for a movie soundtrack. But there's also two sessions in July 91 and February 92 also. And uh, you don't know who plays on what sessions, um, but I would say that, that you know Harold Anderson plays wonderfully. Uh, this is a, 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 it's moody. It's not experimental, but it's kind of moody and dark. But I listened to this today, and uh, this is one of the albums I forgot to to pull out actually when I recorded my first failed video um, of Ralph Towner. And in a way. It's kind of good because I listen to this. I'm like, oh my god, this is one of the most, this is one of the most incredible albums I've ever heard. Um, it's really that good. I, I think, I'm not sure if it's still in print. I hope it is. Um, but Ralph does play guitars. There's not a whole lot of Ralph on here, but it's just an example of one of his sessions. Um, oh, damn, that's a great album. Oh, that's a, I, I forgot how great that album was. Moving on to something else, 2003. I found about the CD that this here's a CD that went. Uh, this was a, a benefit uh, for a nonprofit organization, where a lot of um, produced by John Schaefer. If you if you ever heard, if you're an NPR fan, there's a program that's been on since the early 1980s that I've listened to. It comes out of the NPR New York station WNYC, but it's syndicated throughout the whole country, and it's on. It's on in New York and most stations like late at night, like 11 o'clock at night, seven nights a week. It's only an hour-long program. But they play avant-garde, experimental, uh, modern, classical, ethnic, anything unusual. I would say anything unusual, but like serious kind of music composers. Um, you know, but they'll play Ralph Towner. Ralph Towner's been a guest on the show. Um, what they put together a uh, benefit CD, a two CD set, and it's one of these things that they printed up the initial copies of, and however many they printed up, I don't know, 5,000 or whatever, that's apparently all they printed up in, in 2003, and they sold them, and I found out about it many years later, it was already out of print, but I was luckily, lucky to snag a copy. Um, Pierre 
Ben Susan plays on here, the California Guitar Trio, Alex DeGrassi, Bill Frizzell, Joel Harrison, Henry Kaiser, Tony Levin, Gary Lucas, Michael Manring, uh, I'm sk Vernon Reed, Arlen Roth. I'm skipping over a lot of people that I are not familiar with. Andy Summers, who I forgot played on here. Who would have guessed I just did an Andy Summers video? I, I don't even remember the, his track on here. Ralph Towner, Ben Verdery, if you know a Latitude, the band Latitude. Um, but the interesting thing with this, the reason I bought this, and I spent probably too much money for it, there's like a two and a half minute track on here. Ralph Towner, one of those rare instances, wrote a short little piece. And by the way, all the pieces are unique to this album. It's not just a bunch of tracks from their albums. These are all new tracks recorded just for this album. Um, but the reason I bought it, Ralph Towner recorded and wrote a brand new track. It's it's um, like essentially a duet, a little, a little duet for two guitars, and is in a rare instance, um, he actually plays both guitar parts. Now, like I said, Ralph Towner generally does not overdub guitar parts uh, in the studio, and he plays both guitar parts on here. Um, very, a very pretty little minimal piece, but it, it's. Uh, I kind of wish he did more on his solo guitar albums after hearing that. I wish he would have gone the route of uh, recording multiple guitar overdubs. It just gives you a lot more colors and a lot of a lot more depth to work with. He doesn't do that on those guitar solo albums. They're all essentially live in the studio. And when you hear this little two, two and a half minute track, just a little, little thing for two guitars, it's so beautiful. I wish he would record in that format more often. I completely forgot Andy Summers played on this, or else I would have pulled it out from my Andy Summers video. And just to, to keep going down the, the road of um, side projects that Ralph's done, and I did forget to pull out the Azimuth record. Um, and fans of ECM will certainly know that this um, Egberto Gismonti album recorded in 77, November 77, that has Ralph. Uh, and it's strange that he would have. Um, not, not only well, he has a, a lot of ECM artists on. He has Jan Garbrick on here. Maybe not so unusual because he was in a trio with Jan Garbrick. He has Oregon percussionist Colin Walcott on here. None of Vasconcellos, the percussionist on here, who played not only with um, with Egberto, his big music partner, his for many years, but also with Colin Walcott. And it's got Ralph on here, Ralphie boy. Ralph playing on uh, at least two tracks, playing guitar, which is strange because Egberto Gismonti himself is a non-electric playing guitarist who also, like Ralph, plays nylon string guitars and steel string guitars. So it's unusual that he would invite another guitarist who plays the same instrument on, on a disc with him. But Ralph actually plays on two tracks with him, and they're beautiful. It's a, this is an easy, pretty album to get into. And oddly enough, on one track, Ralph actually plays a bottle, like blowing into a bottle, kind of for a percussive effect, um, on, on on this kind of neat track on here. So that's just a little, another little side project that Ralph did. And the only other thing I have of the things that I remembered to pull out, and I don't think I'm forgetting. I'm just I'm looking over the stack of crap on my bed. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I went over my limit. Whatever. Um, is I found this album. I can remember the store that I found this this album in. Actually, it was a, it was a disco mat store, which is an East Coast chain that's not around anymore. Found this album that was released in '78, so it must have been recorded somewhere around this time by a guy I'd never heard of before, Terry Plumeri. Ongoing. Terry Plumeri is um, an upright bassist, apparently. If you can read who's on this album, though, Mark Cohen, the pianist, Ralph Towner, and John Abercrombie both. So you know, I had to, I had to pick it up. So Mark Cohen plays piano and percussion. Uh, my, there's a guy Michael Smith, who's, who's apparently a percussionist, somebody I'm not familiar with. Different permeations of musicians on here, including classical musicians on string quartet. But um, John Abercrombie plays electric guitar, and Ralph plays acoustic guitar on the same track. Very cool. Very cool. And um, I, it looks like that's the only track that Ralph plays on, but Abercrombie 
plays on no less than four tracks total, three other tracks of the album in a quartet setting with Terry Plumeri on bass, Mark Cohen on piano, and Michael Smith on drums. Those three tracks of the six are just that lineup. Uh, very, very interesting album. Ralph only plays on one track, but it's, but it's an interesting track, and it's an interesting album. And I never heard, and look, I bought it new sealed for three ninety nine. I don't think this ever came out on CD. I never really, I didn't go on a deep, dark search for more Terry Plumeri material, but I think he's a pretty obscure musician. However, once, I was watching a movie, and I want to say the later 80s, early 90s, and I saw the soundtrack was written by Terry Plumeri. So maybe he went into soundtrack writing, or that was his primary thing. I don't know. I've already gone on far too long. I actually have a sore throat. Um, I put on two CDs, and they're both done playing. So I know I've, I've exceeded the 90-minute... <sighs> Sorry, guys. Anyway, um, that's Ralph Towner. That's my take on him. Uh, does it have any value now that I've gone for the entire length of a, an actual movie in the theater? I don't know. But um, hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping this one doesn't screw up, because I, I, I'm not doing this one again, guys. If this doesn't go, if this one doesn't fly, if this file is corrupted, um, I don't know. I, I'll, maybe I'll do it in three sections if I had to. Okay, guys, thanks for watching and commenting and being patient with me, and I uh, hope you're having a great week. Bye.